the past. It's the 1970s. His name is Alan. Alan lives in a place called, I think it's Blue Island, Illinois. He will tell you, Alan will, that his dad is, uh, kind of does a little bit with movies, does a little production, a little editing. Does okay. His mom is a quintessential mom. She can do and does do. Now, if you and I were to ask Alan, tell me, tell me about high school. He would say, well, if it hadn't been for my band, I'd have never got through high school. Here's the irony. If you ask his mom, she would tell you, I don't know how he made it through high school, thanks to his band. My brother Christ, but they'll tell you one thing. His mom and him will agree that the drama club is what set the table. The drama teacher that got him so engaged. Man, Alan got so good at it that as soon as he graduated, albeit 18, he starts his own company called Steppenwolf Theaters in the bottom of a Catholic church. He does his first production called, I think it was called True West. It actually got out, got some publicity. People started to recognize him, give him little extra jobs, put him on sh uh, shows, on plays, a little bit on Broadway. He does another show called Orphans, and that really gets him some recognition. He meets his wife at Steppenwolf Theaters to this day. They are still married and doing well. I got to tell you, brother, sister in Christ, it's the lure of Hollywood, right? So he goes out to L.A., thinking that he's going to make his, his passion. As a result, he gets on the show Frasier. He gets a little bit part. And then all of a sudden, the world kind of opens up for him. He's in movies, Alan is, called Of Mice and Men. He's in uh, the movie Ransom. He was in the movie Reindeer Games. And just when things started to open up, he will tell you that living in Hollywood and working as an actor is like living on a rocket ship. You just never know when this thing's going to take off, so you better keep giving it the gas. He said, man, he just thought his past was catching up with him, the insecurities, the challenges, the mistakes he made. And then all of a sudden, through prayer, and he'll tell you through the church, he says, I meet Tom Hanks. He said the world began to change for him. He said in the movie with Tom Hanks, he was in the Green Mile. Alan prayed the prosecuting attorney that prosecuted the gentleman Coffee, who was on death row. And then all of a sudden, he was in Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. He was, he was the astronaut who didn't, who didn't make the trip. And then his big splash, of which everybody knows him from. He's in a movie with Tom Hanks that takes place in Vietnam. It actually takes place in the middle of a battle scene. They're out, and there's this massive field with rice paddies. And I'm telling you, it is all about the war. It is bombs coming in, planes are dropping, napalm's going off, smoke's going, bullets are firing. This is going, people are screaming and yelling. You can't see 10 feet in front of your face. And all of a sudden, Alan, who's a lieutenant, yells out, Forrest, have you found Jesus Christ? And Forrest yells back, Lieutenant Dan, I didn't know we were looking for him. Yeah, you know Alan. You know him as Lieutenant Dan. You know him as Gary Sinise. You know what's amazing? If you were to talk to Gary Sinise today, he would tell you that through all the trials and tribulations of his journey, moreover his past, there was no better place to find peace than the Catholic Church. My brothers and sisters in Christ, it's all about our past. That's the gospel. That is exactly what Christ was speaking about. My brothers and sisters in Christ, Lazarus, come out. Four days have passed. Four days have passed, and Lazarus comes out. Now stop. You and I need to make sure we understand this. You and I are there. We are there with Martha and Mary and all the Jews in, from Judea. You need to understand things in the light of a Jew. You and I do know Scripture like the back of our hand. We know who, Hebrew Scripture like that. First thing you and I need to know that the Jews believe that after three days in the tomb, you cannot be resuscitated. That's why Christ waits a fourth day. They believe that after the third day, you can no longer identify the body for legal purposes because they don't, they don't embalm. They, they just protect the outer covering, which eventually gives way. So after four days, there would be no identification. As a matter of fact, what they would do is leave it in the tomb, let it decompose. You would go in and gather up the bones, according to the Mishnah, and then what they do is they put it in what they call a box of the bones. That way you could have everybody together. In other words, you would have the complete body. Hence, go back to the prophet Ezekiel. 
where he'll put flesh on the bones and breathe fresh, excuse me, breathe air into the flesh, which goes to the bones. Now, my brother and sister in Christ, he's purposely waited four days. You also need to know who are the Jews here. The Jews are the Jews of Judea. These are the ones in southern Jerusalem that do not like Christ. This is why you notice that Christ gets a little perturbed. You know why he's perturbed? Because the Jews in southern Judea not only do not believe him to be who he is, but they also have professional criers at, at these burial services. These aren't people that care. They're just paid to cry. This is why he's perturbed. Not only do you not believe me, but you're really not caring whether you cry or not. You're just getting paid. My brother and sister in Christ, you also need to understand about, about Lazarus himself. Remember, he's been in the tomb four days. Notice what the good Lord does when he finally gets to the tomb. He gets to the tomb, my brothers and sisters in Christ. He makes them take him to the tomb. He's been to Lazarus' house. He knows exactly where it is. But like at the wedding to Cana, he doesn't want to touch anything. That's why he stands in front of the boulder and says, now remove it. And even though Martha and Mary say what they will, at the end of the day, they remove the thing. And then he yells, Lazarus, come out. If Jesus says only come out, the problem is everybody arises from their graves. This is the second coming. Lord Brother Christ, he called him by name. Names are significant. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, the names of the couple in there, it's not Adam and Eve. Adam, Adama means ground. He doesn't get that name, if you will, until he's after the moniker, until after they sin. Eve doesn't get her name until after she's kicked out the garden. Names are significant. So therefore, when you see a name in Scripture, it's not parabolic. The name of Noah, Jonah, Lazarus, they're all real. My brothers in Christ, do you know what he says? Come out. My brothers in Christ, did you listen? Did you listen carefully? He was bound hand and foot. This is where they get the term swaddling clothes in a manger. So the baby doesn't scratch himself or doesn't hurt himself. That the legs are somewhat bound and the hands are bound so they can't hurt themselves. He can't walk out. That's the miracle behind the miracle. Christ always has, it seems, another miracle in the behind the scenes. The blind man and the deaf, who's blind and deaf, yet when he gives him the ability to see and speak, he already knows the language. He can already make identification marks. And yet here's a guy that comes out, but yet he can't walk. His hands are bound. Did you notice, Brother Christ, as a Jew, that the mask that he would have had on his face, that they had to remove it for him? Go back to the tomb of Christ. Where was the one that was placed on the face of Christ? It was several steps away. Christ is driving home the point. I'm the only one that can remove death. As he gets up, walks off of where he was laid and places it in another part of the tomb. Lazarus doesn't have the ability to do that. My brother and sister in Christ, think about how powerful this must have been for Martha and Mary. And remember this too. When Martha comes out, she does something very unique. She lays prostrate before Christ. My brother in Christ, everybody who believed Christ to be the Messiah either bows, lays prostrate, knelt or genuflex this is why you and i before we receive communion during consecration we're kneeling and if you can rec and receive him by kneeling to do so why because everybody who recognized christ the messiah in scripture did one of four things we're brother and sister in christ go back in scripture my brothers christ all of our best players are people that had a checkered pass think about it mary magdalene here she sits Mary Magdalene, she has all seven demons. Pride, anger, gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, and envy. But yet she's the first to go see the risen Christ. Think about where she's at. If she had worried about her past, you're telling me she's going to get up on Easter Sunday morning when everybody else is not going to the tomb? She is going to go walk out there by herself for a woman who has no rights in, society, in Jewish society. She's going to have to walk through the guards that took well advantage of her in her prior life. You've got to move a stone that's way too big and break the seal that Pilate has sealed with wax. All to be next to a dead Savior. But because she'd rather be next to a dead Savior than a live people, she's willing to forego her past. What Mary Magdalene understood is not where I came from, it's where I go from here. She's the first to see the risen Christ because she said no matter what my past is, it's irrelevant and immaterial. It only matters where I go from here. My brother and sister in Christ, what if you're the good thief? 
Dismas. You spent your life pillaging and plundering, raping. You made your dad look like a Boy Scout. That's no small undertaking. And here you are at the crucifixion, about to have your shins broke so that you can suffocate, just minutes before, I guess, it's time for the Passover. And yet, you make a public proclamation. You can care less about the number of people you killed. You can, it, it, it's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is I must tell the Messiah, remember me. He is so sorrowful, he can't even get the words out. He just wants to be remembered. And because he makes that public proclamation, for going whatever the past may be, the good Lord says, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. My brother and sister in Christ, what about Peter? What if Peter had said, Lord, from the very beginning, man, I was always a problem. I, I, I doubted whether we were going to catch fish. Then I decided I could walk on water. And if that wasn't bad enough, I tried to get you to not say my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And you say, Satan, get behind me. And if that's not bad enough, I'm not even there for your crucifixion. If that's not bad enough, I cut off a guy's ear while I was in the garden. And if somehow or another you can get past that, I denied you. <laughs> not once, not twice. I did it three times. What if Peter says, enough. I'm done. Nobody can get past this. I quit. Do we have apostles? Do we have a church upon this rock I will build? Do we have a name change, Protos? Do we have a baptism of some 5,000 people? Do we have the first miracle of the cripple? My brothers and sisters in Christ, what if you're Joseph of Arimathea? What if you have decided that, you know, I really didn't defend the good Lord like I was supposed to in that public hearing, so I gave up my tomb. But, man, if I could ever relive that past, I'd surely stand up for him more now today than ever before. Don't you see, my brother and sister in Christ, all of our best players, Mary Magdalene, the good thing, Peter himself, not to mention Joseph of Arimathea. My brother and sister in Christ, the question for you and I is 2,000 years later, how bad does the past haunt you? How much of today is spent on yesterday, the day before, the month before, the year before? My brother and sister in Christ, how much of your day is spent with the woulda, coulda, shoulda demon? If I woulda done that, or coulda done that, or shoulda done that. How much time do you spend saying, man, if I would have just done this right, our relationship would have made it, our marriage would have done better. If I would have just spoken prudently, maybe I wouldn't have gotten fired. Maybe the relationship with my children would still be there. If I had just walked away from the alcohol, or the drugs, or the pornography. My brother in Christ, don't you see? The evil one wants you to live in the past. Let me make sure you understand this. He hates you. In the very air that you breathe. You've been made in the image of Jesus Christ. And as a result of it, he hates you. And everybody that's tied to you. Lucifer is a liar and a cheat. He wants you to believe he's got a string on you. He wants you to believe that he can tie you back to those drugs. He wants you to believe that alcohol and pornography cannot be beat. He wants you to believe that your anger is so bad and so deep-seated, there, there is nothing that can be done about it. My brothers in Christ, he wants you, the evil one, to walk through life backwards, hitting everything in your path. You'll never hear Christ call your name. And by the time you turn, it'll be way too late. My brother Christ, I am begging you, cut it loose and let it go. It does not matter where you come from. It only matters where you go from here. Don't you see? Everything else is a lie. Brothers of Christ, everything that the devil brings up, everything about your past that has derailed, derailed you, you and I are carrying it like it's a life sentence. My brother Christ, listen to me. Never, ever, be a prisoner to your past. It's only a life lesson learned. It is not a life sentence. It is not a death sentence. It's just a lesson learned. What I'm asking you to do is to start anew. It's where you and I go from this day forward. My brothers in Christ, I want you to cut it loose and let it go. Whether it's the job, it was the contract, it was the relationship, it was the person, it was this, it was the family. It was about the money. It was about the prestige. It was about the car. It was about the camp. It doesn't matter. You and I have one job and one job only. 
And that job is to get to heaven. I do not care what your profession is, how much money you have in the bank, the clothes you wear, the club you belong to, the camp, the boat, the fishing gear, the hunting gear, I don't care. The only thing that matters is that you make it to heaven. My brother and sister in Christ, cut it loose and let it go. And I'll leave you with this. If Mother Teresa could come back today and tell you one thing, I bet you it would be the poem she wrote called Anyway. It goes like this. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are happy, people will be jealous. Be happy anyway. If you are successful, you'll win false friends and true enemies. You succeed anyway. If you are honest, people will cheat you. You be honest anyway. If you spend a lifetime building something, they will destroy it overnight. You build it anyway. Because at the end of the day, it was never, never between you and them. It was only between you and him anyway. Go forward. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit.